Ellis was sick of rain. It felt as though it hadn't stopped raining since he first docked in France a year ago. And if it wasn't rain, the sky was pouring down with steel. Every hour of every day, artillery pounded the land, turning the ground to an inum into an unending quagmire of mud and eviscerated corpses, with the wreckage of war-making equipment, tanks, artillery, even the occasional crashed biplane, dotting no man's land like sprinkles on a cake. It made for a horrifying and awe-inspiring view, one that made it hard to tear your eyes away. Unfortunately for Ellis, looking out at No Man's Land was his entire job on night patrol. It was an utterly boring, yet also nerve-wracking job. Watching for German raiding parties was a lonely posting as well. All around Ellis, he heard the snores of his fellow soldiers, and thus he tried to keep the squelching of his boots in the mud to a minimum and that Ellis spotted something, up in the skies, out in no man's land. A glint, a faint green glow, growing ever stronger through the dark clouds. Standing up on the parapet to get a closer look, Ellis watched as the glow grew brighter and brighter, until finally, whatever it was, broke through the roof of dark clouds and fell to the earth, a great ball of sickly green fire. A rare moment of silence descended upon the trenches, just for a moment, before the artillery started up again, as it always did. He turned back to return to his patrol route, only to see someone else ambling through the trenches. A tall man, dressed in a grey suit and scarf, looking like a banker on his way to work through a war zone. Ah, good evening, or should I say good morning. The civilian's voice was cheery and boisterous, shattering the relative quiet of the trench. The soldiers curled up for sleep around them gave annoyed groans at the sudden noise. Oi! Shut it! Oh, apologies. Didn't mean to wake you all. Very rude of me, I know. Here, have a sweetie. The strange man reached into his coat pocket and produced a bulging paper bag, which he offered to one of the dozing soldiers, who took one of the offered sweets hesitantly. Um... Cheers. The civilian grinned down at the soldier, and only then realised he had an audience. Hello. I must say, it's good to see someone up and about. I'm rather lost, you see, and I was just hoping you might offer me some directions. D directions Yes, directions. This place is a bit of a maze, I'm afraid. I've passed the same severed arm and barbed wire three or four times now. I don't know how you chaps managed to navigate these overbuilt ditches at all. <laughs> yeah, it's a wonder. Sorry, who are you? Civilians ain't exactly normal around here. The stranger didn't seem to hear Ellis's words, however, instead ambling over to the sign nailed to the trench wall. Ah, Carnaby Street. I must say, it's changed a bit since the last time I was here. Fewer twenty-somethings with money to burn, for one. Besides that, I can't say it's much of an improvement, though. Oh well, I'm sure I can still find a decent jacket. The man's ramblings were beginning to fray on Ellis's already worn nerves. Oi, I asked you. Who are you and what are you doing here? The stranger didn't move or make a peep for a few seconds, and Ellis wondered whether or not to give the man a little bash on the back with the butt of his rifle, just to wake him up a bit. But then, the stranger suddenly whirled around, giving the young soldier a toothy grin. Smith! John Smith at your service, my dear man. All right, that's your name. Now, what are you doing down here? You're only exactly dressed for the trenches. 
Uh, no, I suppose I'm not, am I? You'll have to forgive me. I wasn't exactly expecting such uh, conditions when I arrived. If I had, I probably would have put on some wellies. Indeed, Smith's shoes and the bottom of his trousers were already splattered with mud. Ellis felt a pang of sympathy for him. Now, as to my purpose, well, it's all quite simple, really. I'm a journalist. A journalist? Yes, a journalist. A weaver of words, a scribe of stories, the creator of columns. All those and more, my boy. Right, well, you got any papers? Indeed I do. Here you are. Smith flourished a white card. For half a second, Ellis thought he saw that the paper was utterly blank. But when he blinked, words suddenly appeared. Dr. John Smith? Blimey! You're the head reporter for the Times. I am. I mean, yes, of course. It took me gallons of blood, sweat and tears to get that position now. Right, well, I suppose you want to meet with the captain. Uh, maybe not right this minute. It'll be dawn soon. I was hoping that perhaps I could interview a few of you chaps over breakfast. Us? Yes, you. Well, who better to ask about the state of things than the common Tommy trudging through the mud, eh? All those generals and their big warm chateaus and gourmet meals, they're hardly likely to have much of a perspective on how this war is really fought. You foot sloggers, on the other hand. For some reason, Ellis felt flattered by Smith's words. Perhaps because he hadn't gotten such praise since joining the army. Or perhaps it was just the way he said it. Such conviction and belief. Well, I'm sure the boys won't mind. Hell, a few of them will probably be downright excited to chat with you. I haven't had much ado around here for a while. Have you been on the front lines long? A few weeks, I think. I don't really know. Down here, in the trenches, all days just sort of blend together. You know what I mean? Oh, no, I'm afraid not. I have something of an interest in time, you see. Each and every second I can sense them. Feel them all pass. Blimey. Sounds like hell. Oh, no, it's quite comforting, actually. To know that time is always passing, always going on without a care for us little mortals. I can always rely to be there. Good old time. Right. As the young soldier led Dr. Smith through the trenches, the first rays of pale golden autumn sunlight began to shine through the white clouds on the horizon, illuminating the frost-flowered battlefield and fortifications. Dr. Smith cooed in delight. Ooh. Well... Isn't that a picture? I suppose that's one way to describe it. All Ellis saw before him was the war-torn visage of what might have once been a rather idyllic stretch of French countryside. Four years of war had left little more than the shattered remnants of trees, farms and military equipment, dotted with muddy shell holes and rotting corpses. I don't mean the field, you know. Look, over there. He pointed his finger out to a bramble of rusted barbed wire. Ellis squinted wondering what the journalist was seeing, but then saw it himself. A little scarlet-breasted robin perched upon one of the metal strands. Then, under his gaze, it opened its beak and let loose a chorus of birdsong. What a falsetto. Oi, oi, no time for bird watching. You've got a war to win. The familiar sound of his little brother's voice made Ellis give a tired sigh. Nonetheless, he turned to meet the young man as he ambled down the trench, feet squelching through the mud and bundled up in great coat and scarf. Hello there. I'm Dr. John Smith. Lovely to meet you. Oh, hello. Both the doctor and the private enthusiastically shook hands with each other, both with grins on their faces. Blimey, a real doctor. Archie will be pleased. Uh, Archie? Like with trench foot. Ah. Now, I'm afraid I'm not that sort of doctor. Oh. Yes, I'm awfully sorry. I do have a bit of medical knowledge, but nothing on trench foot, I'm afraid. Oh well, suppose though Archie will have to grin and bear it a bit more. Dr. Smith's a journalist, Danny. He writes things for the paper. Here, does that mean you're going to write something on us? I hope to, yes. Cool, we're going to be famous, Ellis. Fame is all you need, Danny. Come on, I'll take you to meet with the lads. The motley trio set off down the trench. As the sun rose, so too did the previously slumbering troops, clambering from their dugouts and breathing in the fresh, chill morning air, lighting up breakfast cigarettes. 
Ellis nodded silently in greeting to a few of the men he recognised, as did Danny. The doctor, on the other hand, seemed to be making it his life's work to shake the hand of every man that lined the trench and learn their names, and there was only a curt cough from Ellis that made him move on. Eventually, they reached their destination. A small group of soldiers were clustered together, eating bowls of thin porridge and drinking steaming mugs of tea. Morning, lads. All right, Douglas. Who's the civvy? Good morning. I'm Dr. John Smith. I'm a journalist. Pleasure to meet you all. Oh, a journalist, eh? What are you doing down here in the mud, then? Well, better speak to all you chaps than another general gorging himself on venison while he splutters about whatever insane strategy he fought a minute, few minutes before. <laughs> Fair enough. You've suddenly picked a good time to drop in. Oh? Why is that? There's an offensive on this afternoon. Oi, don't go shouting out all our plans, Danny. Loose lips sink ships and that. You needn't worry. I don't intend to sink any vessels. Now, this offensive... Uh, this might be something of a silly question, but could one of you tell me what the date is? I know it's 1918 from the air, but the month I'm something of a loss at. No shame in that. It's October. The 8th of October. The 8th of October, 1918. Of course, the Battle of Cambrai. You've only got a month to go. Month to go until what? Hmm? Oh, I forget I said anything. I suppose that this will be the big push, eh? Yep, another one. Don't listen to him, Dr. Smith. It's going to be different this time, our captain told us. We've got tanks on the ground covering us. Our flyboy is up in the sky and enough artillery to blow a hole the size of Surrey in the Hunch trenches. That was the plan at the Somme too. Didn't turn out too well then, even with a week's worth of arty dropped on the buggers. Don't know how much that's going to hold when we go over the top. Well, there's nothing wrong with a bit of optimism, you know? I suppose it's been quite busy lately with all the preparations. Lots of uh, ammunition to move. Yeah, we've been busy all week getting ready. I swear, I can hardly stand up on me night patrols. I'm even getting hallucinations. Oh? What sort of hallucinations, uh, might I ask? Ah, it's nothing really. Just my mind playing tricks on me. Nonsense! I'm quite a fan of nonsense. Please, go on. Uh, alright. Well, it was last night, just before I met you, actually. Just some sort of bright lights. What kind of bright light? Oh, blimey. I don't know. Sort of green, I think. It it fell from the sky. Hmm. What if it's some sort of secret weapon? Ugh, don't be bloody stupid, boy. What? Secret weapons aren't stupid, our tanks were secret, and now they're what's going to win us the war. It wasn't a secret weapon, Danny. It wasn't even real, just my eyes playing tricks on me. Suddenly, their chatter was interrupted by the sound of shouting further down the trench. The rest of the regiment were being roused from their breakfasts by a cadre of officers striding through the fortifications. Come on, chaps, come on! Up and at them! We've got a bloody war to win! Seems our last meal's over. Uh, Private Ellis, I wonder, would you mind talking with me away from the others? For just a moment? All right then. Both men shuffled off to the side, out of earshot of Danny, Douglas and the others. Now then, this light you saw, where did it land? Out in the battlefield. But Doctor, it wasn't real, really. I told the lads, I'm sure it was just a hallucination. So you think? Do you think you can tell me where it was? A couple of hundred yards from where we met. Hmm. Well, you'd best join your comrades, Ellis. Might give you your help. It was no problem, Doctor. No problem at all. I hope you'll write fondly of us in your newspaper story. I'll make sure of it. Au revoir, Ellis, and good luck. Waving farewell to the journalist, Ellis rejoined his squad, standing to attention as they were inspected by their captain. The rest of the morning was thick with tension, as there always was before a battle. Men had their last sermons with the regimental chaplain, kneeling in the mud and murmuring prayers to God that they might be safe, and, if they were to fall, that their families would be safe without them. Others took on more practical activities, checking and cleaning their rifles. Making sure they were all ready to kill. Ellis spent the rest of the morning with Danny, helping him write a letter to their mother and father, and sending it off with the army post. He could tell his little brother's nerves were high, despite all his previous laddish bluster, his shaking knees and wringing hands making it obvious to all that looked. 
Ellis didn't bother with any false reassurances. There was no point in getting the boy's hopes up. It would only make the betrayal in his heart being shot all the more intense. Instead, he focused on sharpening his bayonet, making sure every inch of the steel was spotless and wickedly sharp. Finally, at about 12 o'clock, the time came. The officers' voices bellowed out above the distant pounding of artillery, ordering the men into position before the trench ladders. Both brothers took their place with the rest of the men clustered before the muddy ladders. Here we go, Danny. As Ellis checked and rechecked his rifles, cocked and ready, he felt someone bump into him. Looking around, he prepared to give whoever it was a verbal lashing, only to be met by a familiar, grinning and friendly face. Doctor? Hello again, Ellis. Fancy seeing you here. What are you wearing? Dr. Smith was now wearing a weather-beaten army greatcoat over his suit and scarf and had smeared some mud on his face. In place of a gun, however, he instead carried a vaguely rifle-shaped stick. I did tell you I was going to look for a new coat. Listen, you got to get out of here, Doctor. Things are about to kick off. Oh, I know. In fact, I'm rather counting on it. Before Ellis could question Smith's motives, and, indeed, his sanity, the sergeant's voice suddenly thundered out, ordering the assembled men to stand to. Ellis did so in a snap, and tried to ignore the doctor's amused chuckle. All right, chaps. This is it. The time has come. We'll cut through those German trenches like a hot knife through butter, and carve up the enemy like vermin they are. Like the rats they love to eat. (laughs) Remember this day, gentlemen, for it is the day that this war ends. If the captain was hoping for cheers... He walked away, disappointed. The most he got in return for his words were nods or quiet eyes. The soldiers had no time for stirring words anymore. All their thoughts were on one thing, and one thing only. Survival. A familiar hush fell over the men, and a thousand shoulders tensed as the captain raised the whistle to his lips. Finally, after a few more eternal seconds, the shrill sound of the whistle cut through the cold air only to be drowned out by the roar of a thousand war cries. With the rungs of the ladder were slippery with mud, but Ellis went up nonetheless, followed shortly by Danny and Dr. Smith. Together, the three of them began to charge with the rest of the regiment, sprinting and splashing through the mud and shell holes that covered the battlefield. All around them, carnage reigned. Artillery shrieked and exploded, sending out plumes of flame and smoke and whistling chunks of shrapnel, and bullets flew through the air, finding purchase in mud and man. This way! Come on! Oh Christ! Oh God! I got you, Danny! Keep going! Through the morning mist, Ellis could see far off flashes of fire and knew instantly that they were the German trenches. Afraid not, Private. I've got some business of my own. Eh? Looking around, Ellis saw that Dr. Smith was charging off in the opposite direction, towards a deep crater. In his hand was what looked like some sort of silver wand, the tip of which shone red and warbled some strange reverberating sound. Doctor! Come back! Leave him, Danny! The two brothers continued their sprint towards the German trenches, firing their rifles as they went, until finally they reached the parapet. Together with the rest of their regiment, they fell upon the Germans with cries of war and flashes of bayonets. For the next few moments, the world was just screaming and gunfire. Ellis whirled around, bayonet thrusting and wet with German blood. Then, as soon as it all kicked off, silence descended upon the front trench leaving the British troops standing above the corpses of both their enemies and countrymen. No rest for the wicked lads. There's more of those bastards for our rock trench. Tally ho! The rest of the troops went after the captain, and Ellis prepared to follow, only to see Danny leaning against the wall of the trench, breathing heavily. Bloody hell. It's all right, Danny. I got you. Danny practically fell into Ellis' arms, the first few tears beginning to drip from his eyes. It wasn't very glorious. Never is, mate. Never is. But you can't let it get to you. Not now. 
Still got a job to do. Yeah, uh, I I <laughs> Danny fell to the ground with a wet thump, uniform rapidly turning a dark red from the newly made hole in his chest. Slumped behind him was a previously fought dead German soldier, a still smoking rifle clutched in his hands. The German didn't last much longer, as he fell over dead half a second later, his last act on earth done. Ellis fell to his knees, holding the young man tight in his arms. Danny tried to speak, but only managed a choked cough before, slowly, the life left his eyes and he went still in his brother's arms. Danny? Danny! No. Oh God, I am... Sure, it was just an hallucination. He was back, in his own trench. Ellis looked all around, letting out a shaky gasp, mind whirling. He'd been in the middle of the German trench, and Danny... The doctor was looking at him calmly, concern shining in his eyes. You felt it too, didn't you? What? Felt what? The time energy, shunting you back an hour in time. I felt it too, but then again I'm... Well, me. You, though, you're a perfectly ordinary human. You shouldn't be none the wiser. Ah, uh, I was in the German trench. Danny, he'd been shot. And he died. Not now. He's alive and well and waiting for you to join him in the charge. But I felt him go limp. I felt his last breath on my cheek. It was so real. Because it was real. It was the future, Private Ellis, and it will happen again. As will this conversation if we don't stop this timer loop.